Hi, I'm Martin. And I would like to invite you to dedicate the next couple of minutes to a very special kind of dialogue. Your inner dialogue, your thoughts. Because thoughts are real forces. Let's start with our morning routine. So I'm sure every one of you can call up the routine and the sequence of things you're doing usually in the morning. Let me introduce you to mine. So when I am up, um, I have several layers of dialogue already going on. One is a pretty unconscious one. My autopilot, washing, shaving, dressing up, making breakfast. Then there is the actual talking, like welcoming everyone to the day. Yay! And um, then there is the checklist in the back of our heads uh, to move our four kids, for instance, at first from bath to bathroom, then making sure that all their heads and arms and legs find their way through their clothes. They eat, they drink, they brush teeth, they have everything packed, and they move out the door on time. And then there are some other topics like most important meetings of the day or some family schedules in the evening. But before all that happens, I take five to seven minutes and I think about my goals while I'm doing some stretching or warm-up exercises. And I think about how I would like to be today, how I experience myself today. Five to seven minutes. Because when we're up about half an hour, there were already, statistically, some 2,000 thoughts running right through our head. And they will count up for the remaining day to 70,000 thoughts. And there was a point, a true turning point for me, when I realized it's an endless variety that we can call up, that we can envision, that we can think through an endless variety of thoughts. But we are so limited in time, thinking time. Now, what kind of thoughts I would like to think? Thoughts that give me power, that excite me, or that remind me of what I'm part of, and what kind of thoughts I would like to actively dismiss. So coming back to our morning routine, I'm not checking the news. I'm not checking weather forecast. I don't check my emails. I don't check training schedules. I don't check football results. And I don't check any kind of social media. Yeah, that's a hard thing, right? Because there's always this little idea that suggests, come on, just grab your phone and have a look. Well, it's not only that it is always a little decision, it's the factor of the decision that is pretty interesting. Because it seems that it's not really a interesting if it's a small decision or a very big one. Decisions are often incorporated into our conversations. And now we're having 70,000 thoughts in one day on the one side, and we have all the actual talking and the written conversation on the other side. So it seems that there's a lot of talking on, a lot of talking going on during the day, right? But of course, there are also emotions attached. But let's just right now focus on the conversation. And the conversation itself, we all know, has usually two parties, a narrator and a listener. And some years back, I played a great role as a narrator, but not so much as a listener. And I would like to tell you how I discovered that, what I did about it, and why this was a true turning point for me. Okay, eight years back, I saw myself failing my marriage. It started with a conversation that my wife and I had about her plan to take some seminars and to pursue and enroll uh, in a course of studies for psychology. And within this conversation, it was pretty quickly obvious that I was puzzled and positively surprised because I must have missed out a lot of previous conversations. So I haven't really paid attention when it really mattered before. And at that time, I really thought, OK, there's so much going on. I have to remember so many things. I have to take care about so many things. I have to organize so many things. I simply forget something, right? Well, in a series of conversation that followed, my wife revealed together with me that it was not just this particular topic that was missing. It was actually 
a lot from our first three years of marriage. Now, at that time, my usual behavior was that I prepare my thorough answer while the other person is still talking. So I missed out pretty much of what the person was saying when I just faded away and prepared myself. Of course, I wasn't really aware about this, and um, I was only aware about one thing. Something has to change. I maybe have to change. My wife felt this, that I really saw this urgency and I had to change, and she supported me. And whenever she recognized that I'm fading away in my thoughts while she is still talking, she kept reminding me very patiently. And I started seeking, you know, I had to really find a way, a guidance, a kind of advice. So I started books, I watched videos, I enrolled in an online class, I even went to a live session to tackle my main question. How can I actively listen and how can I stop myself from thinking? So after a while, the more that I searched, the more that I heard, the less it made sense to me. There were exercises that suggested you just have to tackle your childhood imprints. All right, let's try that. But I actually had no idea what to do in specific. And another one suggested you just have to allow yourself to fail. Yeah, that sounds easy. But still, I had no clue what to do. Another one proposed you can just change your habits. All right, last try. Still, I was pretty not on the right path. And after a few months, I simply lost track. And then a situation came by. I was out on my bike, heading to work in the early morning. It was cold air, very fresh. I could see my breath. And as usual, on the cycling, um, I saw other cyclists, I saw joggers, and I saw some dog owners. And one of those dogs wasn't leashed. And that particular dog, in this particular morning, must have thought, you, my friend, going to be my next bunny. So when I passed this dog, this dog was kicking off, chasing after me, and I went all out on my bike. I was really scared. The dog was already next to me, snipping at my red foot, at my left foot. And after 100 meters, the dog turned board around back to his yelling owner. And I was so relieved, full of adrenaline, pretty much sweated, and my thoughts were running. And I thought, what could I have done differently tomorrow, today morning? Should I have taken a different route? Should I have rang the bell? What, would have, what could have happened? I should have, maybe I would have fell over or something, I got injured or something. And then I thought, what if I can actually face this dog owner again? And I can really give him a lecture, how to walk his dog, or just how to use a leash. And then I suddenly saw myself snapping, hey, wait a second, I'm on my bicycle. Everything's okay, I'm not injured. The dog's far gone. Everything's okay. So what is actually going on here? It seems I'm the only one who allows this movie, this crazy movie, to continue to play. Of course, it wouldn't have been a breakthrough moment for me at that time if I wasn't in that particular situation, trying to find a way to build up back my marriage. So my first step was not to change my habits. My first step was not to allow myself to fail. My first step was not to tackle my childhood imprints. My first step was that I'm the owner of my thoughts and every thought takes time and time is limited. So what am I spending my thinking time on? My first step was, I decide. And it was the most important approach for me at that time because I understood that active listening is a personal decision. And that particular decision actually forced a pretty big conflict with me, my usual behavior, and my mind. 
Because at that time, usually my mind just kept throwing thoughts at me, and I reacted on them. Now that I actively acted against my mind by dismissing this movie from the dog, actually trying to dismiss it, and then what was brought back, I felt the true force, and I felt this is something that's gonna help me, maybe. So this force got stronger, and I realized I had to take my mind to the fitness center. So come on, little mind. Let's go to the fitness center and have some practice. And we practiced, and we trained, and my mind didn't like it. My mind found a lot of good reasons not to take the practice. My mind found a lot of very good excuses not to think about practicing. So after all, all those books and audio classes, they basically built my fitness center for my mind. But in the end, it was my wife that trusted me, believed in me, a stranger dog, and the pure factor of time that really gave me a different perspective. Now, little by little, my growing ability to observe my thoughts, to change my thoughts, and to actively listen to others, started to affect some other questions that were bothering me a lot. Questions like, why am I not getting a better job? Why isn't my salary higher? Why is there so much tension in raising our eldest son? Why do my wishes and dreams just remain what they are and don't become my personal reality? So let me try to make a transfer here, because we are all basically continuously involved in those two roles. But taking those roles back as a narrator and a listener may truly change your game. Because you decide whether you look at a situation, get angry about an error, or just detach yourself from it. And you decide whether you think about an event in the past over and over and over again. And you decide how much you engage yourself to create your personal reality. And I would say, seizing this incredible power of engaging needs and requires the right sentences in your head first. Because thoughts are real forces. <laughs>